Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. I have different sections in this video. If you'd like to jump from one section to another, you can find the names of the chapters and the chapter links in the video timeline if you hover over the bottom of the video playback. Otherwise, there are also direct links down in the video description. So really I have three main things I wanna talk about today. One of them is sort of a tidbit-ish topic. And then I wanna talk about the new project that I started this week, which is a vintage 1890s sweater. So I wanna talk about the things I've already learned from knitting it so far. And then I wanna talk about changes that I have made to this pattern and how I make a decision about uh, changing a pattern, whether it's a contemporary pattern or a vintage pattern, like how do I go through that process and decide whether or not that's something that I wanna do. So let's get started. So my first tidbit of the week is this oldest written knitting pattern. I had been hearing about that and I've been trying to uh, find this pattern online and not having any luck. It's contained in a book that was published in 1655 in London. The title of the book, and I'm going to blow this because the beginning seems to be Latin, Natura Extenterata, or Nature Unboweled by the Most Exquisite Anatomizers of Her, wherein are contained her choicest secrets, digested into receipts, fitted for the cure of all sorts of infirmities, whether internal or external, acute or chronical, that are incident to the body of man. So that's the title, and it was allegedly written by some fancy lady, may or may not have been supervised or written by her, no idea. Um, and it's one of these kind of books that people would have in their homes that gave, it's like an encyclopedia. So how do I, you know, concoct a recipe for rat poison? How do I make a recipe for, um, for red dye so I can dye some fabric? How do I make a pot roast? So recipes of that sort, but also just general instructions for things that you would need around the house. Like how do you do these kinds of things? So it was just that kind of a general reference book. So there used to be a link to the book on a Arizona University website. That link no longer works. I looked everywhere that uh, I Googled and Googled and I found various references to that book, but no place that had it digitized. So if anybody knows of a digitized version of that book, that would be great. Um, in the meantime, uh, I have an uh, online acquaintance who ha either has the entire book or at least the section where the knitting pattern occurred, and she sent me that section so that I could see the, the knitting pattern. But there is an article in Piecework Magazine from, I'll put it on, I'll put it here and I'll put it down below from, I think it was 2012 or 13. It's the same issue that had the polka jacket in it that I talked about a couple of weeks ago, same issue. Uh, so I'll leave a link to that. It is a digital version of the magazine that you'd have to purchase, but it's pretty interesting. It's, their, it's one of their annual historical knitting issues. So there's a lot of cool stuff in there, not just this article. And I believe in the article they, sh they have the original pattern published in full as well. So over the years, many knitters have tried to knit these stockings. And Richard, uh, Richard Rutt, who wrote A History of Hand Knitting, was one of those people. He includes uh, the pattern, or at least the, his version of the rewritten pattern toward the end of the book. And so many people have just, you know, said, you know, it's, there's just too many errors, can't really knit the stocking from that. So the woman who wrote this article decided that she was not going to look at how other people corrected the pattern. Then instead, what she was going to do is just knit the pattern as it was written and see what happened. Because some of the things that she thought were weird were things that other people thought were weird too. Like, it seemed like there were a whole bunch of increases around the ankle area that just didn't seem right. But she decided, I'm just gonna knit this and see what I end up with, because who knows? So she knit the stockings. So they're knit with cotton yarn, which is very inelastic, 
knit at a not just a fine gauge, but a very firm gauge. So there's no stretch in those stockings at all. And that means if you had a shaped stocking from your thighs down to your ankle, if they were as narrow as your ankle actually was, you wouldn't be able to get that past your heel because the sock wasn't going to stretch. So we rely these days on an elastic fiber wool and we're not knitting to a gauge that's as firm um, relative to the thickness of the yarn as they were knitting. So in order to get that sock past the heel, the ankle had to be roomier. But they're not knitting socks. They're not knitting something that ends right below the calf muscle like we are, where we rely on the, the negative ease of a sock and the stretchability of the sock to really hug our leg as it changes shape in order for it not to fall down. But they were knitting stockings that went up to their thighs and they were suspending those stockings by using garters of some, something to hold those stockings up. So they could tolerate something that was looser around the ankle and they would have needed it in order to get past that heel because the, the heel diagonal is, is much larger than your ankle circumference. So that is something that I think is really interesting because it's something that I keep in mind when I'm knitting from vintage and antique patterns is that if I come across something that just seems wrong to me from my contemporary viewpoint, I keep in mind that the point of knitting this pattern, this old pattern, is to learn things. And it's very possible that there's something about this pattern and the way that they constructed it and the way that they did the shaping that makes total sense for that garment. And, you know, I've picked the garment because it's constructed in a very different way than I'm used to. And it might have a different fit than what I'm used to in contemporary patterns. So I need to trust the pattern and then see what happens. And, so, and then if I discover this isn't fitting right, or this, uh, I understand now what they were doing, but I'd get a better result if I did this other technique, then I might rip it out and do it. But otherwise I trust the pattern and just see what happens. So my new project, which I've been talking about for a couple of weeks is an 1890s sweater. And I think the pattern is called Just Knitted Sweater for a Boy. Uh, it appeared in uh, two places. Uh, it's published by the Butterick Company. So the Butterick Company had a, a monthly women's magazine called The Delineator. And it was mainly a, a marketing tool for selling their sewing patterns and knitting and crocheting and whatever patterns. Um, so it was a monthly magazine. And then they had... Um, a compilation of knitting patterns that they published in 1897 called Fancy and Practical Knitting. And this pattern appeared in that book. So that appeared in the pattern book that was published in 1897. And then it appeared in the delineator in 1898. So many of the sweater patterns in this 1897 issue actually appeared in the delineator either in 1897 or maybe in the year or two before that. But this particular sweater didn't occur in the delineator until after the book was published. So the pattern, like all patterns of that era and well up into like the 1940s, was in one size. And the size that it was written for was a boy of 10 to 12 years. The reason I chose this pattern was because it has a very unusual construction method um, for the the part of the of the sweater that's from the armholes on up. It's a construction I've never seen before. I don't really fully understand how it works. And so I want to knit it and see if it does in fact work or if it was just some crazy idea that a knitter had that isn't really workable um, over other sizes or it's just difficult to modify for fit or, or not. I don't know. It's really hard when these kinds of new uh, three-dimensional construction methods that I've never seen before that are knit in the round. It's really hard for me to get a sense of what actually is happening in each dimension that's going to uh, affect uh, 
of the fit in the length. You know, when, when you're knitting this fabric, um, it can come out this way and it's also going this way and how do these things all work together? So I don't know. So that's why I chose this pattern. I either could knit the pattern as it was written and not worry about the actual size it was, or I could try to make it fit me. The problem with trying to size it up and not using the instructions as written was I didn't really understand how to grade it because I didn't, since I don't really understand how things work, I, I wouldn't know how to proportion different parts of it differently. So I really felt like I needed to just write, um, uh, knit the instructions as they were written, but at the same time, I wanted it to fit me so that I could actually see does this work and how does it fit and where does it fit weird and where, it, you know, where could it be improved or how could it be tweaked? So I needed it to fit me, but I wanted to knit it as written. So the way I solved that was to use a different yarn weight than what was called for in the pattern. So the pattern calls for a yarn that's called uh, four threaded German yarn. And I had done enough research to realize that's the same type of yarn as what was called a Berlin yarn or a single Berlin yarn, uh, which also would have four threads or four plies to it. And it was probably uh, a fingering weight. So maybe like at the, even at the heavy fingering weight to light sport weight range, probably something that in stockinette you would knit at six and a half stitches per inch and you'd probably get about eight and a half rows per inch. That's probably what you would get. What I realized was that if I knit it with a worsted weight yarn, it would give me a circumference that would fit me. What I don't really know for sure is uh, how proportional the row gauge is in the yarn that I'm going to be using versus uh, the yarn that was called for. It's really hard to tell. Like I can tell how long the sweater is going to be in different parts. Um, and it seems really long. And part of that is that they did knit their sweater bodies really long. But once I get up into this territory that's really unusual, I, I really don't know how all that's going to work out because the instructions don't tell you knit it till it's this many inches long. It tells you knit this many rows and then do this for this many rows and then do this for this many rows. So they must have been assuming a particular row gauge, but they never give it and they don't tell you the, <laughs> the finished length. So it's one of those things where I'm going in a little blind, but that's okay that's what I'm here for. I'm here to learn. So the yarn I decided to use, I have lots of worsted weight, a sweater's worth of worsted weight yarn in my state, in my stash. If I look up there, I have one, two, three, four, five to six sweaters worth of worsted weight yarn. And all of that worsted weight yarn is pretty much the same. It's like 220 yards and 100 grams or 200 meters and 100 grams. Very standard, very basic, exactly what I use. I totally understand that yarn every time I use it. It has four plies. I, I just get it. I know how that yarn works. I didn't have enough. I needed two colors. I needed a lot of one color and this sweater again is going to be long. So I need more yarn than I would normally need for a sweater of my size. Uh, and then I needed a, a high contrast color and I don't have that situation really in my uh, stash. And so I decided to take the opportunity to buy some uh, brown sheep yarn nature spun worsted weight yarn and and use that for the sweater it's a yarn that i've been using for i think a couple of years now for my technique videos when i do my swatches i'm almost always using nature spun i really like it but i've only ever used it for swatches and it has some differences from the the worsted weight yarns that i normally use those yarns, for all I know, those yarns are all processed in the same mill or in mills that are identical to that to get that yarn at the 200 meters, 220 yards, 100 uh, grams with four plies. Those yarns are so identical. Those mills must be, if they're not the same mill, they're set up the same way. Brown Sheep Yarn is an American company and they have this, uh, I think it's called vertical manufacturing, where they do everything in their mill. They're not like getting, 
of the wool from Argentina and having it scoured in that country and then sent to be carded and, and spun somewhere else. It's not like that, where a lot of yarn companies are like that. It's completely American made. So they're using uh, wool from sheep that are um, bred in the western United States. The wool is sent to Nebraska where their factory is. They scour it, they dye it, they card it, they spin it. And the way that they spin it produces a yarn that is different from these other kinds of worsted weight yarns. First of all, it has three plies, not four plies. And it seems round, it seems plumper. It seems like fuller and thicker. And yet there's more yardage. There's 245 yards in 100 grams instead of 220. And yet, and yet the yarn seems thicker and fuller. So I assume it has something to do with the way that they are carding their yarn that's different and a way that they're spinning it that's different. So it's not producing the same yarn that you get from every other um, yarn company. So that was another reason I wanted uh, to try it out in a sweater. I just was really intrigued to see what the difference would be. So I wanted to use the colors that would have been authentic for the time. Uh, and anytime I am knitting a project, one of these vintage projects, I think a bit about the techniques that I'm going to use versus the techniques that are called for in the pattern. Um, I like to knit things the way that if, they, if there's a specific technique that they mention to use, uh, even if I normally would use a different version of one of those techniques, I will try it the way the pattern says first because I never know, I might be surprised the way the woman who knit the stockings I talked about earlier was surprised. Like, let me just see what happens if I follow the directions as written. And then if I see the result and I think, no, I could get a better result if I did this other thing, then maybe I'll take it out and redo it. For example, for short rows, they might uh, say just to knit across until you're four stitches before the end and then just go back in the other way. They won't say to use a technique, a short row technique. Uh, and so I might want to see, well, does it make a difference in this pattern if I don't, if I just turn around and go back, what if I use my, my short row technique? And the very first sweater that I knit, one of these antique patterns, called for using short rows with no specific technique. And I thought, I'm just going to do it with the way they say and see what happens. And, if, and I wasn't intending on wearing the sweater or even finishing it, so I just, I'm going to do what they say. And I did it, and what I noticed was after I'd done all my short rows and I had to work across all of the stitches, what I had to do as I worked across all of those stitches was I had to work a series of knit three together and knit four together, knit, you know, a ton, like every, every stitch I knit was a decrease. It was either a double decrease or a triple decrease, so knit three together, knit four together. And so it did not matter uh, whether or not I used a short row technique at the turn. And in fact, it was better that I didn't. It made it easier not to have to deal with that technique when I was trying to work stitches together. So in that case, I'm like, oh, made a lot of sense to do it that way. In the next pattern I worked, they actually called for short rows again that, that had a more refined method of working a short row, which is to turn and slip a stitch. It's a more refined and it was in a more visible location. So I tried that and I assessed it and I thought, no, I'll get a better result if I use my standard method of doing short rows, like German short row. But I tried it because I didn't know uh, when it was combined with the stitch pattern I was using, if it would make a difference or not. So I tried it the way it was written and then I made, it, made my assessment. So I always try it the way that they state if they state something specific to do. So here, here's what I've got so far. So I've got these white stripes and I'm knitting in the round. So I'm using a circular needle. They called for, I think, six double pointed needles, you know, longer double pointed. I'm, I'm not gonna use those. <laughs> I don't have six double pointed needles, but I do have a circular and it's not going to make a difference. The purpose is to be able to knit a tube in the round. But what does happen when you knit stripes, in the round is that you are actually knitting a spiral. 
So you're starting the beginning of the round and you knit all the way to the end of the round. And so you work the last stitch of the round and then you work the first stitch of the following round. The last stitch of the round is right next to the first stitch of the, of the next round. It's not next to the first stitch of the same round. That looks like it's a row below. So if you're changing the stitch pattern, if you have a texture pattern or if you have a color pattern and you have to change the pattern when you get to the end of the round, you'll get this jog at that point. You'll, you'll see a visual disruption in the pattern. So this, this pattern didn't say anything about uh, trying to um, hide that jog uh, at all, but yet I know a modern technique that will do that. So this is the trick that I use when I am doing something like stripes in a ribbed fabric where I have knits and pearls showing on the right side of the fabric. I want to avoid those little blips that you get um, in the purl stitches and I do that by working the first round just in all knits. So you're also going to notice I have this marker here in this purl column that is going to be the first stitch of this particular round because I'm going to use a second technique which is the jogless jog technique. Um, but I'm going to start by working only in knit stitches. So even if it's a purl column, I'm going to work the stitch as a knit. And this is only for this first round. Um, and what you see is that as these white stitches are coming off the needle, they're the ones that are coming off as knit stitches. You can see I've got little purl bumps. The running threads between the, the stitches are showing up as little um, blips on this face of the fabric. but I don't get any blips on the right side of the fabric. And that is because the white stitches are the ones that I'm actually knitting. I'm using red yarn and I'm knitting, but it's not the red stitches that are, that are knit. It's the white stitches that are coming off the needle that are actually being knit. The red stitches on this needle are just potential stitches. They are going to be, they're not knits or pearls at this point. Okay, so I'm getting to the last stitch of the round, but now I'm going to do the jogless uh, jog technique, which is to lift the old color, which is the white, onto the needle like this. I'm actually going to work these two strands together. So I'm going to work them together as one stitch. And what that does is the white stitch ends up enveloping the first uh, stitch that I actually worked in red. So it just pulls that fabric so that you don't see the jog. So now this is the end of the round rather than the beginning of the round. So now this is the new beginning of the round. This appears to be the first stitch that was worked um, in red. So this green marker down here shows where the original beginning of the round was when I began this sweater. So this knit column here was the first um, stitch of the round until I worked the white and then it moved over. And then when I, when I moved to the red, it moved over once more. When I changed to the white, it moved to this purl column where this uh, marker is and now it's over here. So this is just it, it changes the beginning of the round in, in re with respect to when I start working another color, but I'm not going to actually change the beginning of the, of the actual round of the work. I'm still going to keep this column of stitches as my beginning of the round um, so that this stays uh, underneath one of the arms. So from now on, I will be working in the ribbing pattern. So this is a knit column right here. So I will work this first stitch of the round as a knit. So I use those two modern techniques when I was doing the stripes in this antique sweater. And I decided to do that because I thought, well, I'm going to get a better result. And it's not the kind of thing that's going to stand out as, ooh, that's really modern. It's just like, it's hopefully it's just going to be invisible and you won't even notice that there are no blips and you aren't going to notice that there isn't a jog. It's just going to be stripes and that will be what you see. Well then the next thing I needed to decide was how am I going to cast on? That's always the first thing I think about before I start a pattern is what category of cast on method do I need for this project? Is this a project that starts at an edge? Is this a project that starts at a, at a 
at the closed end of a tube, like a sock toe, like we need a special kind of cast on for that. Is this something where I'm starting in the center of something circular? So I need like a drawstring or, or a pinhole opening and then I work out from there. These are all different categories of casting on. And so I needed something where I would start at an edge. And normally I would just use a long tail cast on and that was certainly a technique that was used uh, back then. Uh, but I don't normally knit a lot of knit one, purl one. I tend to, when I'm newing ribbing, I tend to prefer knit two, purl two. When I do knit with a knit one, purl one ribbing, I often will choose a tubular cast on or an alternating cast on which is ideal for knit one, purl one ribbing. It gives you this edge where the stitches just come down to the bottom of the work and then they just kind of roll around to the other side. There's no edge. Like there's nothing that says this is different from stitches along the edge. It's just the stitches just roll around and it looks really nice in knit one, purl one ribbing. And that for some reason I was like, mm, that's going too far with the modern techniques. I can't do that. So it's like I rejected that and I knew a long tail cast on was a possibility, but I thought, you know, I wanna look and see what this particular knitting manual, what they include in their cast on methods. Um, because most of the knitting manuals, if they had a general reference section, would have at least one method of casting on. Sometimes they only had one method. And usually it was knitting on if they only had one method, but sometimes they had two or three different methods. And when I've looked at these manuals in the past, sometimes the method that they had seemed like maybe it was a long tail cast on, but the way it was described in words, I couldn't quite work out what they were talking about. There was definitely one needle involved in two strands, like a long tail cast on, and yet, I couldn't figure out what they were saying about how the yarn should be wrapped around the hand. Like it didn't make any sense. So I didn't really think about it. So this time I decided I'm gonna look and see what they have and, and really work out the different methods that they have. So the book that I got this from was called Fancy and Practical Knitting by Butterick uh, Publishing. And it was their second knitting um, book. This one was considered more advanced and for more expert knitters. And they referred to their first knitting book, The Art of Knitting, which was published in 1892, as uh, that one was more, had more basic patterns. So I thought, well, I'm gonna go look and see if The Art of Knitting had a general uh, reference section. And I looked in there and they did, and they had three methods of casting on in their book. They had, and they just called them method one, method two, method three. They didn't label them. They didn't call it the thumb method, the continental method, the Italian method, the, you know, they didn't call them anything. It was method one, method two, method three. So method one was knitting on. And then method two, there were some, there were some pictures like drawings of how the yarn was held and how the needle was held. And they were holding, and I'll put the pictures up here. They were holding the yarn in a way that sort of seemed like the long tail cast on, and yet not quite. It was over the thumb and forefinger on the left hand, and then it, but it just came over to the right hand to be tensioned over. It just, it wasn't, it just wasn't what I was used to. And then I was looking at how they wanted the, the needle inserted through this, these loops of yarn. And I'm like, why are they doing, what is going on? And I spent a long time trying to work it all out. And finally, you know, I made sure that the yarn was hanging the way that it was supposed to and that I had the correct tail hanging over my uh, forefinger and the actual end of the yarn was, you know, hanging over my thumb and I had all of that and I was inserting everything correctly and just, okay, now I understand what they're having me do. And I was focused on, on, on figuring all of that out. And I did probably seven or eight stitches. And then I took a look at my needle to, to see what I had. And I was like, I recognize this. I did not recognize that process, but I recognized the result. And the result was the same result you get if you do a twisted German or, or old Norwegian cast on. And it's also the same result you get if you do what's called the main cast on. So I knew that there were two ways of getting that result. 
and this particular method wasn't either one of those. I, I dove into some research because I thought, okay, hold on a second. If that produces the same result uh, as the twisted German, which I know is based on the continental method of long tail cast on, and I could see that this method that they showed in the art of knitting, I could see how you could make this a long tail cast on with the yarn wrapped around your hands in that particular way. I could see, I thought this must be a legitimate way of doing a long tail cast on. Pulled out a couple of books. I pulled out my uh, Principles of Knitting by June Hemmons Hyatt because I knew that, that she would have a bunch of different ways, I was guessing, of doing that cast on. And I pulled out my copy of the uh, Knitter's Handbook by Monty Stanley, which also usually has a bunch of different methods. And I opened them up. And it was really interesting because each of them had, I think, three different ways of achieving this particular edge, but only two of them overlapped. So they each had one that was unique to their own books. That was just a fascinating thing. And so by having all of these different methods and seeing how all of them were related to a specific way of doing the long tail cast on, I learned so much that I didn't expect because I assumed that I knew all the ways of doing the long tail cast on, like the two ways. There's not two ways, there's three ways. And I also finally understood more about how that twisted German cast on, like what is really going on with the twisted German or old Norwegian cast on. And I understood it by doing this method that was in the art of knitting. And what's really interesting is that a Monty Stanley uh, gives labels to all of these different kinds of cast on methods. So she she has a label for each method of long tail cast on and then she shows you how to do it for this twisted version. And so the method that this art of knitting was demonstrating, she called the Italian twisted cast on. So I, so I looked through, you know, a few pages earlier to see how she described all of the long tail cast ons. And she called that one the Italian cast on, which is kind of funny because there's probably four or five different Italian cast on methods. <laughs> I've been collecting Italian cast on methods. There's so many of them. Some of them are tubular, some of them are alternating, some of them are one of them is a long tail. So these labels for techniques can be so confusing. You can have multiple labels for one technique. You can have multiple techniques for getting the same end result. And you can have one label that refers to several techniques. And when I learn something that I've known for so long about knitting, I've never looked it up in a reference book because I know how to do it. It just doesn't occur to me to look it up. So I was really happy that I happened to go look in this 1892 book and to see how they said how to cast on, then to go on this dive into research and discovering that I have actually quite a few books that, that show this twisted cast on, usually in a couple of different, different forms, uh, and they, they have different names for them. And it, so it just makes it really hard sometimes when you're trying to look something up to realize that this could, the thing that you want to learn about might have a bunch of different names and there might be multiple ways of getting to that same endpoint. So the next thing I have to think about with this sweater is how long I actually want to knit the body because the instructions are telling me that after I finish that white stripe that I need to knit 105 rounds of the red uh, before I split the front and the back um, to, to start working the shoulders. So with the gauge that I'm getting, I know that that means the total body length is going to be about 20 inches long, just to the underarms. Normally, if I were going to make a sweater for myself, I would probably uh, make that 16 inches long. So that's gonna be four inches longer than I would normally make it. Um, which is quite a bit longer. And I've seen in the photographs from the 1890s and early 1900s that when these sweaters that were used for as athletic garments were worn, that they often flipped that hem up 
and I'm like, okay, well, if I flip the hem up, then it's going to be covering up the stripes. <laughs> like, what's the point of the stripes? So I don't know. I mean, I probably wouldn't wear it with the hem up unless it was too long or too tight around my hips and I was sitting in a chair and then maybe I'd want to flip it up. I don't know. So I have a lot of knitting to do in the next uh, week or more in order to get up to those underarms. It's going to be a lot of uh, boring TV knitting, basically. Uh, that I have in store for me uh, for a while. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.